I did a wedding a number of years ago, probably 20 years ago. I don't, I don't remember when. I, I, probably, I could have actually looked it up, but it didn't matter. Uh, I did this wedding, and uh, we're talking to a young couple. They're preparing for, for, for marriage and, and, you know, going through the normal wedding day stuff. And uh, I, I, we got to the part of the vows, and, and, and the, the young woman said, uh, now, don't use the word obey. I, I don't want to obey my husband. We're 50-50 in this thing, right? And uh, I, it kind of took me back a little bit. I, thought, I, mean, I, know, I knew where she was going. I knew, I knew where, what was going through her mind. And I gave her a pass because I thought she's really misunderstanding some scripture that uh, gets thrown around a lot. And you'll, you'll recognize many of these probably if you've been in the church for any length of time. Uh, sometimes they're, they're misunderstood. Sometimes they're misapplied. Um, and... and uh, th- Knowing her the way I know her, she wasn't trying to rebel against God. That wasn't her point. She just didn't understand what this scripture re- really says. And, 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 and to be honest, at, at first glance, some of these scriptures are um, uh, kind, of take, kind of take your breath away a little bit. In, in our modern world, we think, well, what, what's, what's he talking about? That can't mean us, right? Like, like 1 Peter 3, when Peter says, likewise, likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands. Now, I love that verse. It's a great verse. Um, but there's more to it than that. It, it's not just, you know, hey, wives, you're the slave of your husband. But if you look at it initially, you think, whoa, that's, good. that's kind of scary. What, what am I signing up for here? But you put it in context, and, and it changes it. Um, Peter, in this case, is talking to a wife who is married to a, an unbelieving husband. And, and, and he's counseling women who are married to unbelieving husbands. This is how you best reach your husband. Because, because the number one goal is for your husband to go to heaven, right? I mean, you want to be uh, forever with your husband in heaven. That, that's obviously the goal. And um, there was a lot of people who, especially in the first century, but it's true today too, that a lot of people who, uh, especially when the news of Jesus was just spreading, one person would convert and the other was like, uh, I don't know about that thing. And, and, and so you had a lot of marriages where one was a believer and one wasn't. And Peter's talking to the women who are married to unbelieving husbands saying, here's, here's how you help them. It's, it's, it's from your inner beauty, not, you're not, not from you, you know, whining and nagging and, you know, yelling at them. Here, here's the fuller context. 1 Peter 3, 1 through 7. Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands. So that, those are pretty a couple key words, so that, here's why you should do this. So that, even if some of them do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of of their wives. So your lifestyle should, should draw them to Jesus Christ. They should look at what you do, how you live from day to day, and say, wow, there's something special about you that, that I would like to know what it is. And, and you can say, well, it's Jesus, and then and you introduce them to Jesus. That's, that's what he's saying here. When they see, verse 2, your respectful and pure conduct, do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair, the putting on of gold jewelry, the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. For this is how the holy women who uh, hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands as Sarah obeyed Abraham. There's that obey word, right? And calling him Lord, and you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Here's some balance. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way. Understand them. Get to know them. How many husbands understand your wives? Maybe the lights are dim. Jeff, Jeff, we've got, let's see what's, we've got one. <laughs> we all, we'll, we'll have counseling later. Uh, understand, in an understanding way, uh, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel. We'll, we'll, we'll unpack that a little bit later because people go like, what? What do you mean? Well, it's not talking about arm wrestling. It's talking about other stuff. Uh, Since they are heirs with you of the grace of life so that your prayers may not be hindered. So you read that verse, initially there's some all kinds of little red flares that go off. What do you mean submit? What do you mean be subject? What do you mean? Yes, she has to call me Lord, or I have to call him Lord? That's crazy. It says, we'll, we'll unpack this a little bit. How about Ephesians 5? This one throws people for a loop. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church and uh, his body and is himself its savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. I love that verse. (laughs) 
Submit in everything to their husbands. Now, again, at a glance, at maybe your initial reading, you, you, you might think, well, this is saying, obviously, that the husband gets to pick what we watch for TV every night, right? And you have to just like what I watch. And the husband gets to pick what we have for dinner every night. Whether you like fish or not, you're going to have it. You know? And, and you know, stuff like that. The husband gets to call the shots and, 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 and say the rules and lay down the law, and you just have to follow around like a little puppy and, and decide what to do. But... but if it ended there, if, 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 like if, if Paul or Peter, depending on the, the text here, switched to a different subject, and he ended right there, and that was the only verses we had, I'd have to say, yeah, you know what, you're right, sorry. Um, that's, that's what he says, that's what the Bible says. But it doesn't end there, it keeps going, it gives us a fuller context. It, it gives two sides to this coin here. He goes on in verse 25 in, in Ephesians, husbands, love your wives. I mean, not just warm fuzzy, but really love them as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. You know what that's talking about, right? The crucifixion. He died, he died for him, the, her, the church, us. He died for you. Now, now, husbands, you love your wives with that same type of fierce kind of, kind of love, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother, hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a profound, this mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each of you love his wife as himself. Let the wife see that she respects her husband. Now, what, what these verses do is describe this uh, little dance that takes place in the marital relationship. Uh, uh, you know, a step here, a step there. It's, just, it's, it's, a, it's a dance that lasts the entire number of years you're together, uh, of trying to figure out how to manage what this is talking about. How do I love my wife? How do I submit to my husband? What, what does that really look like? And, and, and that's why I called it a dance. You're walking step in step with one another, trying to outserve one another, trying to outlove one another. That's what you're looking for in the marriage relationship. This is not talking about who is smarter than the other, who's more qualified than the other. It's not talking about how we relate to each, to, to, to each other as far as uh, you know, making all the decisions. It's talking about how we relate to each other in, in our day-to-day -day lives. How, how, how do we just manage our relationship as, as a married couple? So we're going to break this down a little bit, uh, wives and, and husbands, and, and I'll start out with the wives, um, and then um, you wives can spend the rest of the time you know, doing, doing like this uh, when we talk to the husbands. Um, a message uh, to the wives. Our, our society <clears throat> puts a lot of pressure on, on women um, on how we define beauty, uh, on, on what we expect uh, out, of, out of our women. Um, we tend to connect beauty with having, you know, uh, the right hairstyle, whatever that happens to be right now, or, or a perfect complexion, um, proper fashion, and that changes continually. What, what, what do you call, you know, it's fashionable today. Uh, it's going to be different than what's fashionable tomorrow. Uh, having all the right curves and all the right places, and everybody defines that differently too. Uh, I went to the gym the other day, uh, last week, and uh, because I had... Uh, it's 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 been long enough that I had lost my card, and I thought, okay, I need to, I really need to, you know, be working out, and and I'm ready, you know, I've mentally, I've prepared myself, okay, it's time to do this. I need to, to physically challenge myself again, and, and um, I go there and I talk to the this young woman at the counter. She's I don't know, 25. Uh, probably has about 4% body fat, um, you know, not, not that I measured, but I'm mean, just saying she's you know, very fit. You know? I wasn't being a creeper, but I was just going, she's extremely fit. And, and, and hitting all of what our culture would define as beauty, you know, has all the right stuff, right? Um, and her clothes and hair and all that stuff. And I tell her, man, I really, I'm really you know, needing to, to keep working out again. I need you know, to have the conversation. And, and, and I don't know if she's just being polite 
you know, having the conversation uh, like, oh, with well, a poor, overweight, middle-aged guy, I'll just be nice to him and have, say I'm in the same boat, you know, or if she really thought this way, but she was like, oh, I'm in the same, I know exactly what you mean, I need to work out more too, I, I'm looking terrible right now, and, 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 and she just like totally degraded herself in this, in this conversation, and, and I, she goes, I even got a job here thinking, because if I work here, I'll actually work out, because of course I don't, because I just work, you know, and, and uh, all this stuff, and I, and I left thinking, Boy, I hope she, I really hope she was not serious, you know, that, that we put that much pressure on someone uh, th that you're just never good enough. I don't care what you look like, you're never, you know, there's always more that has to happen. You know, that's, that's the pressure, though, our society will often put on women. According to one survey, 80% uh, of American women claim to be dissatisfied with their appearance and shape. 80%, I don't know, maybe it's more than that, maybe it's us, but that's, that's a lot. That's a good chunk of people look in the mirror and go, yeah, yeah, I'm just not very happy. You know, uh, may, may, maybe we're looking at the wrong things. You know, I mean, you want to be healthy. I'm not talking about that. You want to be fit and all that good stuff. That's that's all great. But but what did what did our Creator tell us? What did the one who designed us say? Uh, should we we should strive for? If we read it, First Peter three three through seven. Do not let your adorning be external. Your beauty. Don't let it be external. The braiding of your hair, the putting on of gold jewelry, the clothing you wear. Don't, don't worry about that stuff. Let your adorning be the hidden person of your heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is in God's sight, which in God's sight is very precious. He's saying your beauty does not come from what you see in the mirror. That, that is not, your, I mean, uh, you're attractive, whatever. I mean, they, whatever. That's not your beauty. Your beauty comes from the inside. Your beauty comes from who God is, is creating you to be and recreating you to be and forming you to be on the inside of your soul. Now, it's not that fashion's bad or, or hairstyles are, 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 you know, don't, don't try to be trendy. It's not like that. Um, some of the issues this is talking about is more cultural issues of, hey, don't look like a prostitute, you know, basically is what, what Peter is saying here. Uh, so, so that's not bad, but, but the point is don't let that hide the person you really are. Let, let be, be who you are. Be who God has made you to be. Let that shine through. Don't try to hide it. Don't, don't try to be someone else. Just, just be who God is, is making you to be. I, I love Proverbs 11.22. Like gold, a gold ring and a pig snout is a beautiful woman who shows no discretion. You know, it's like you can put lipstick on a pig, but it's still a pig. I mean, it's just, you know, don't be the pig. You know, don't, don't, don't just think, I'll throw some next slip on and it's going to make everything great. Just be, be beautiful on the inside. Your goal in life life is, is to be like Jesus, to live like him, to look like him, to, to sound like him, to, to, to walk like him, and let that be the beauty that radiates from you. Now, now obviously, I mean, you're, you're not going to get away from the fact, I mean, like in, in our, our dating relationships, it's been a long time <laughs> since I've, I've been dating, right? But uh, you're, you're not going to fully escape uh, the, the physical side, you know, attraction uh, of things. Obviously, I mean, my, my wife and I, Cheryl, was, was 19 and I was 21 when we got married. So we were, we were very, very young. Um, and so we probably met, she was probably 18 and I was 20. Um, and and it, was, it was the physical attraction that, that I first said, hey, I'd like to get to know this person. You know, I mean, uh, so, so there's obviously a, a physical side to it. But, but that wasn't what made me say, I'd like to spend the rest of my life with you. It, it wasn't like, man, I love the way you cut your hair. That's it, you know. That is what I was looking for in a, in a wife. Um, I, I love, I love that brand name of shirt you're wearing. <sighs> you know, um, that wasn't it. it. It was getting to know her as a human being. Like I said, those things might have attracted me to her in the first place. But as we got to know each other and have the conversations and and and, and hang out and go on the dates and all that stuff, I, I I began to realize that she was this this person of of selfless. You know, unselfish. She was just an unselfish person. She was a giver. She cared about people. She 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 sacrificed for people. It, all those things. You, you know. And those of you who know her know exactly what I'm talking about. That's just her personality. This is the way she is. And it was those parts of her I looked at and said, she's she's beautiful. You know. And 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 for those of you who maybe have known her for for a long time, we've been married what 32 years or so now. Uh, she's had multiple hairstyles. You know, she's had multiple name brands of clothes she's has, she has worn. You know, things change on, on the outside, but, but she's the same 
beautiful woman she, she has always been that, 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 that attracted me to her. I, I don't care physically, well, I mean, I don't care for her as a human being, but I mean, I don't, I don't, it doesn't matter to me what happens to her physical body because, because it's, it's her that I love. You know? And that's what Peter is talking about here. That, 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 that beauty be the inside of you that just radiates out, that, that people just see the, the inner beauty of who you are, of, of God working on, on your heart. So that is uh, the starting point. If you're a woman, that is the starting point of, of this marital dance for you. That's that first step. That, that's that, uh, you know, your, your first concern, I sure look, look nice and everything, but your first th- concern isn't combing your hair, it's do I look like Jesus? You know, uh, put that as that first step in this marital dance, and, and, it, and it, it might shift some of the things you're, you're doing in your life, which will shift and change your relationship. Um, it, it's uh, very important to understand that part when we get to the context of these verses we've read that uses words like submit, you know, um, uh, subject yourself, like, like the scripture said. The word submission that, that's used in, in scripture is, is a military term. It means to put yourself under. So it's a voluntary position. Now in the military, you're not, it's not a voluntary, you're, you know your rank and that's just what you are. But, but Peter says in, in your marriage, you just say, you know what, I'm going to choose to put myself unto you. It, it doesn't mean you're, that they're smarter, better, all the above. It just means I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to submit to you. So, so do you see how important it is to really put a lot of prayer and, and thought and forethought into, is this the person I'm going to spend the rest of my life with? Can I say, please take the reins of our family and uh, I'll go with you. I trust you. That, I trust you. It's an issue of trust. I trust you that much. You know, uh, that, 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 that's a key thing for a woman to ask herself. Um, like I mentioned, the Bible does not say that women are inferior to men or, or that men are the bosses of women. It simply instructs women to, to voluntarily put yourself in, in a place of, I'm going to let my husband take, take the lead in, in the direction that, that we're going. Now, one reason I think God does that is because he's our creator. He knows how we're designed. He, he also knows that that totally feeds into how we're built and, and as men and uh, emotionally what, what we need, you know, our, our emotional needs a, a, as people. It's one of those basic needs. Uh, I, I don't want to make all the decisions in our family. I mean, it would be boring if we only did what I did all the time. I don't, I don't need to be the guy who rules the house with an iron fist. I don't, I, don't, I don't need my wife to bow down when I walk in the door. It might be fun once in a while. But, um, no, it's a, it, you know, it, that, that's just not, that's not what Scripture's talking about here. Um, I, 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 I just need to know that she values my opinion enough to say, okay, I trust you. Um, let, let's, let's go with this direction. Now, I, I, she might have input, obviously. She's going to have all kinds of conversations. She's going to say, I notice we're headed toward a cliff. Um, maybe we should ten, turn left. <laughs> you know, uh, I, I'm not going to be the guy who says, well, no, I'm the man, so we're going this way. You're not as smart as I am. And then we go off the cliff and then we're all in trouble. Um, you know, what, what do they say? The neck turns the head, right? I mean, that, that's just how it works. So, so that, that, that's... that's you know, you have conversations. This isn't, this isn't a, a ruling thing. It's a, hey, I trust where you're going. By the way, we're, we're headed off a ditch, off, off the cliff. Maybe we should be careful. Hey, thanks. That's the, yeah, let's, let's have a conversation about how we should do this differently. And, and you know, how many times has she saved our marriage uh, and our family, uh, you know, just by <laughs> keeping us from going off the cliff? Because I like going just crazy off the cliffs um, if, if uh, left to myself. So, so, so wives, your husband has this deep created by God need to be admired and, and to, to, to know that you value him. And, and your, your willful submission uh, totally feeds into that. So, so I think that's part of what Scripture is, is doing there. Now, the danger of this, though, is uh, this isn't all on you, wives. Okay? If you're doing this dance alone, uh, it, it can be even dangerous and hurtful and harmful to you. Your husband has to be involved in the dance. This, this, this is critical. So, so, so guys, and we need to talk about you and your role in this be, because uh, the guys like to, to, throughout the ages, like to tout the, the, the wives submit and subject and blah, blah, blah verses and say, yeah, see, I'm the guy and you're not. Um, but your job is, is, is a huge responsibility in, in this relationship. While your wife is doing her best to, to look like Jesus and live like Jesus, you're doing your best to help her get there. 
uh, not, not in a um, teaching way, but in just an encouragement and, and, and molding type of way. Let's talk about a message to husbands. Uh, over and over and over, Scripture says one thing to the husbands. It seems Husbands, what? I think I heard it. Love your wives. I hear that. Husbands, love your wives. We've read it, so it should be fresh in your mind. Husbands, love your wives. It, 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 that seems to be the number one thing that, that Scripture says to men. It's in Ephesians 5. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present to the church unto himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. Uh, same idea in Colossians chapter 3, verse 19. Husbands, love your wives. Do not be harsh with them. Now, the Greek word I uh, use for love is the one we talk about often is the agape love is that self-sacrificing thinking of the other person type of love so in the marital relationship from the husband's perspective who is the most important person in the marriage okay that's that's god <laughs> who's the second most important that's true the second most important person the wife uh, your wife is, is more important than you are in the relationship. And this is critical to making this whole thing work. If we only go with half the instruction, we're, we totally destroy what God's saying here. And, 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 and we, we, we just discredit him and make him look bad. Your job is to love your wife more than you love yourself. You can't pull the submit card without understanding that everything, everything you do is to lift her up, to encourage her, to build her up in the faith. Life does not center around you. Okay, moment of grief for the guys. Uh, you are not sitting on a throne in your castle of your home. I know that's the big phrase, oh, guys, home is his castle. Guess what? It's her home. It's her castle, and she's the queen. Now, if you're doing this correctly... Uh, she is the queen of the home, and you're the king of the home, and you're treating each other likewise. But if you're just running around with the ki as the king and not treating her like a queen, you're, you're missing a huge part of a marital blessing, and only one of you are dancing. <laughs> and, and that's an awkward dance. I've seen it on TV. Don't, don't, don't do that. Um, but if we're both doing our jobs correctly, the husband is where he needs to be, and the wife is where she, I mean, you're, you're both feeling fulfilled, and, and, and you're, you're loving your marriage. Paul says that we're to love our wives as Christ loved the church. And he gives all these examples. that He, he, he lifts the church up as radiant and blameless and without blemish and spotless and all these things. And I, and I read that. Every time I read that, I think, you know, I don't have to look very hard at my life to find blemishes in my spiritual walk. I don't have to look very hard at my life to think, I'm not perfect here. You know, there, there are issues, uh, there, uh, places, things, you know, whatever. I, I, I'm not the perfect example of, every, of Jesus. I'm not Jesus, right? But Jesus presents me to the Father and to those around as a perfect, holy, spotless person who's never sinned. Why? Because he's covered me with his blood, because he forgave me, because I went to the cross, and I said, please forgive me, and he did so. And, and so I walk around as a saint, I'm called a saint. You are called a saint in Scripture because you've been forgiven by the blood of Jesus Christ. That's why he went to the cross. And, and, and Paul's saying, okay, husband, look at your wife that way. Treat her that way as if she is radiant and spotless and holy and pure and without blemish. And you're thinking right away, well, no, I can think right away of some blemishes in her life. <laughs> I can think right away of some areas where, where she's not all that great. I have a list. I'd love to tell you about it. Okay. And, and Paul's like, oh, no, you don't. Erase that list. You throw that up. You get rid of it. As far as you're concerned, she is perfect. As far as you're concerned, she has done nothing wrong. As far as you're concerned, she is the, the most amazing, spotless, adoring, wonderful queen of the home. That is how you're to treat your wife. Love your wife. Build her up. Make her feel beautiful. Make her feel valuable. You do your job to love your wife, and she will do her job naturally. It's not a battle. It's not a, I don't want to obey you. I mean, because there's no obeying thing. That, that, that's, a, that's a twist. You know, it's, it's you loving her. It's like, can you imagine telling the kids, no, kids, you're going to have ice cream tonight. Any kids going to complain about that? Unless they're lactose intolerant. I should use a different example. Whatever. Give them something they really like. Of course they're going to, they're, they're, okay, I'll submit to that. You know, why? Because I love my kids and I want them to have ice cream tonight. Maybe that's a bad example. Not too much ice cream. <laughs> Don't overdo it. You know what I'm saying here. Um, do your job. Love your wife. And husbands, if you're not loving your wife the way you should, what happens is she will get discouraged with your lack of leadership in this area. 
and, and, and it will hinder her growth. Um, Peter said it actually hinders your prayers if, if you're not in, in a correct relationship with your wife. And, and you will ultimately, um, it'll be a mis, you'll, you'll mistreat her and she'll mistreat you and it becomes a, a real negative thing. It becomes this uh, downward spiral thing of, well, they're not, they're not treating me right, I'm not treating them right. They need to stop, start treating each other correctly and it goes down as opposed to we're building each other up and building each other up. It's a complete opposite thing. So just, just do your job, guys. Do, do your job. This, this is a dance that, that, like I've said, you can't do alone. That's why it makes it so critical uh, when you're at that stage of saying, who, who will I marry? Who will I be with? Um, who will I spend my, my rest of my eternity with, um, rest of this life with? Uh, can I uh, submit to this person? Can I love this person? You know, depending on who you are. Am I good with this? Because uh, you're putting your, your life in, into this other person's hand. Now, before we go, I, need, I do want to clarify that uh, verse in 1 Peter 3, 7. Uh, Husbands, likewise, live with your wives in an understanding way, uh, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel since they're heirs with you uh, in, in the grace of life. This is another one of those examples where you might read it right off the bat and think, what do you mean, do you mean weaker? You know, I, does that mean I should be able to do more sit-ups than her and, and bench press more? And, and uh, yeah, okay, that's good. Um, but that's not at all. That's not all what this is, what this is talking about. Uh, back at the time this was written, uh, you didn't go <clears throat> to uh, your uh, department store to buy your, 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 your dinnerware. Um, and, and you, you went to a potter. And there was a potter, and, and they would make the plates and you know, goblets and glasses and all the different dinnerware things. And uh, it, most anybody could make a little plate. I mean, I mean, you and I could do that. Not maybe as skilled as a, a regular potter, but there were potters that made you know, the, the plates. Well, in, in every community, there'd be someone who would rise above the other potters, and, and they were extremely skilled at, at making their very special uh, dinnerware. And uh, so, so they would have a sign on their shop that would say, weaker, weaker vessels sold here, right? Uh, so uh, it meant valuable, it meant, it meant uh, delicate. So he could charge a whole lot more money for those plates, kind of like if you go to a fine china place, as opposed to um, Target, you're going to get two, two, you know, you can spend 20 bucks or 200 bucks, you know, or, or more, uh, depending on what you're going to get. So um, your, your common plates you'd use every day, and, you know, you break them, you think, oh, that's too bad, I'll go buy another one, you know, whatever. You, you know, it's not a big deal, but your special, weaker vessels, you would put in a special place and only get them out once in a while, say Thanksgiving, Christmas, you know, for us, um, the special occasions for them. And, and they would be treated very, very delicately because they were so valuable. And you didn't want to harm them, you didn't want to scratch them, you know, it, it's not that they were less valuable, they were more valuable. And that's really what Peter is talking about here. Treat, treat your wife as the most valuable I don't want to say possession, but, but if you're making the, the illustration, the person, the most valuable person in your life, the most valuable thing you have, you treat them with love and honor and respect because they're so precious to you. Husbands, you love your wives. Understand your wives. I think part of that understanding is it's, it's an action of I need to know, I need to understand. It's kind of what we talked about last week in the love languages. What is it that speaks to my wife? She is valuable. It might not be what I think. You know, maybe that's a conversation. Maybe that's part of the hunt of a guy of figuring out how do I make my wife feel special. It is a, it, it is a, a, a lifelong job you have. You keep making her feel special, and she will keep making you feel special. That's how you build a long-lasting, very healthy relationship. Um, there you go.